self. Michel Foucault said, Do not ask me who I am, and do not expect me to stay the same. Who am I? Who are you? We've had this conversation before, haven't we? Don't be silly, I don't know you. The I that is communicating to you appears to be embodied within a human body. More specifically, the equidistance between the eyes and ears within the skull. This is, of course, the location of the pineal gland, which Descartes believed was the seat of the soul. However, the speaker's experience of being primarily located inside the skull is just a convenient association generated by the speaker's learned sensory response and cultural upbringing. In some cultures, the I of the self is located in other parts of the body, for example the heart or abdomen. Most people experience themselves as being a body or within a body, the later dichotomy being exacerbated by the use of personal pronouns. However, where does your body begin and where does it end? For most people it would seem that it depends upon what processes they are in a conscious continuum with and in control of. For example, most people have no qualms over moving saliva around in their mouth. However, when they spit out their saliva, the thought of putting it back in their mouth becomes repulsive. You have hundreds of millions of tiny organisms living within your body that are vital for your survival. Are they part of you? At what point does the food that you consume and the waste you produce become not part of you? What about your nail clippings, fallen hair follicles and other bodily deposits? What about if you have a pacemaker, donated organ or prosthetic limb? Are they part of you? What about your car or cell phone? Is that part of you? Of course not, you might say. But what if it is stolen or damaged? Does that not affect you psychologically because you identify with it as yours? Does your skin mark the boundary of yourself? Your skin cells contain semi-permeable membranes which allow molecules to travel in and out. The air that you are inhaling is air exhaled by other organisms, as well as containing a multitude of microbes. Are they still part of yourself? 95% of the DNA within the human body is microbial. That itself shows that the human body is essentially a co-evolved microbial community. We are not so much individuals but walking ecosystems. Nature is not something out there, it is all in here. The elements of nature are constantly migrating and cycling through us. As Watts noted, the prevalent sensation of oneself as a separate ego enclosed in a bag of skin is a hallucination. The world is your body, or rather the world is your soul, your psyche. The Rig Veda says that your eyes will become the sun and your breath the wind. In your turn you will go to the sky and the earth and the waters, your limbs will become the roots of the plants. In mystical cultures and in humans who experience altered states of consciousness, the eye has no discrete location and can appear both inside and outside the body. The view of the world as an integrated whole has been part of a living vision for many indigenous cultures. Traditional Lakota language lacks a word for me or I, therefore emphasizing the continual direct experience of relationship and connection. In other cultures, a tribesman may approach a medicine man to cure his ailing wife, and rather than say, my wife is sick, he would say, my family is sick, i.e. the sickness is as much his own as his wife's. The boundaries of identity are more fluid, as such it would be absurd for such a tribesman to say, I am healthy but my family and village is sick, just as it would be absurd for someone to say, I am healthy but my liver and kidneys are sick. Incidentally, many Native American languages identify objects not by their form, which emphasizes distinctness and separation, but by their activity. This is exactly how Bohm postulated that we should view the universe, not as discrete things, i.e. nouns, but as interrelated processes, i.e. verbs. Therefore, conventional English grammar includes a metaphysics that necessitates a fragmentary view of reality. As Watts also demonstrated, we falsely think of objects as moving by themselves, a dog for example. However, we cannot say what the dog is doing or understand its behavior unless we examine its surroundings. How can the dog be described as running without a reference to the ground upon which it stands and the direction in which it is running, i.e. towards the ball? The dog is running on the ground just as the ground is holding the dog, or the ball is falling through the air just as the air is dropping the ball. All existence is interaction. Is your glass half full or half empty? Typically, in modern society, the aforementioned state of consciousness would be considered schizophrenic. However, most people are still subject to the same phenomenon without even realizing it. The speaker can be quite sure that he is communicating to another I, because without a subject and object, there can be no communication. In fact, the speaker has no self, independent of his environment, i.e. other. The speaker cannot have an inside without an outside. 
The self can never be experienced apart from its environment. George Hegel considered that people are deluded to think of themselves as unique, for everyone is a product of their parents, and indeed their thoughts are not their own, but that of the group. Likewise, Hegel emphasized that one cannot think of themselves as their own identity without thinking of others. Perhaps the most shocking thing to oneself is not that there is an other, but that oneself is an other to another self. That the I that I take to be me is both this subject and object. Given this realization, on closer inspection, this I that is taken to be me is not one, but many. Just as Cressler said, you cannot step into the same river even once. What you consider to be you is a dynamic gestalt. Were you the same you one year ago, or how about even one second ago? We are all constantly reconstructing the mask of an invisible self that remains mostly transparent to our former self, lest we find ourselves in a situation whereby the self is fundamentally different than the former self, for example after an amputation. Furthermore, the I that the speaker has constructed to talk with you is different from the I that the speaker might express to a familiar friend, a colleague or a lover. Since the historical emergence of the self and the rise of materialism, the self has become more strongly associated with symbolic value, with things that can be owned. The modern self maintains itself through continuous acts of identification and commodification. In the 20th century, this change grew exponentially, particularly after World War II with the advent of TV advertising and mass consumption. The countercultural revolution of the 1960s changed consumption habits from homogeneity to heterogeneous consumption, whereby people wanted to assert their individuality. Since then, the idea that identity is both real and permanent has been steadily eroded. Buckminster Fuller said, As a consequence of the slavish categoryitis and scientifically illogical, and we shall see, often meaningless questions, where do you live? What are you? What religion? What race? What nationality? Are all thought of today as logical questions. By the 21st century, it will either have been evident to humanity that these questions are absurd and anti-evolutionary, or men will no longer be living on Earth. Walter Truett Anderson said, All human societies are built upon a lie, the lie of the self. The reason why psychotherapy and self-improvement seem so cursory and cosmetic is because they are. The self that mainstream psychology is described and purport to heal doesn't exist. It is a social fiction. The construction of the modern self has exploded in all directions as personal boundaries and identities have changed and have been neatly segmented into different markets of personal consumables. New fashion allowed people to design a self for a given occasion or social group, be it mundane office work or saucy nightlife. In the 21st century, the plurality of the self is becoming self-evident as it mediates itself through more and more virtual environments. Now in the 21st century, many people live an absurd amount of their life through a web of symbols speaking of symbols to other symbols. Before you know it, a person is well and truly lost within the malaise of the hyper-real. Even now, the speaker is post-ironically contending with such a matrix as he communicates to himself via the proxy of a computer interface. Is there a real world out there somewhere? Do you, the screen, care? No, you are a screen and you project light. The great paradox of social networking is that it uses narcissism as the glue for community. Being online means being alone. An online community means being alone together. As the physical world takes on more of the characteristics of a simulation, we seek reality in a simulated world. We know the simulation is real, and we can be freed from the anxiety of not knowing where the boundary between real and unreal lies. We find something to hold on to, even if it is nothing. As Alan Moore said, there are a frightening number of people who have the urge not just to ignore the self, but actually seem to have the urge to obliterate themselves. You can almost understand, because it is too much of a responsibility.